Good evening, church. Welcome back on this Monday night. Glad that you've tuned in. We are going to be in the book of 2 Corinthians this evening. 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, really focusing in on verses 8 through 11, uh, but touching on a couple other passages and a couple other verses within this passage as well. What I want to talk about this evening is the comfort that comes from God. Uh, obviously, I think during times like this, uh, a lot of people are struggling and we think about the trials and the things that we are enduring uh, just from life and a pandemic and politics and culture and whatever else is out there that's uh, whatever particular trial you may be enduring. Uh, but I want to think about going from trouble to triumph, and that is uh, possible because of the work of God in the lives of his people for his glory. So let's go ahead and start 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to uh, start reading in verse 3. We'll read 3 and 4 and then we'll skip down to uh, verse 8 and then read verses 8 through uh, 11. But the word of God says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Isn't that, I love that. Isn't that good to know? God is the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in, our, in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. It's interesting, too, that the Bible addresses difficult topics such as these. The Bible does not gloss over the fact that you know, we will have trouble in this world and there's much that we must endure. Uh, but thankfully, as believers, we know that God walks with us through those times. And there's a reason for it. And that's uh, some of what we'll be talking about this evening. Continuing in verse 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So let's look first of all. I've kind of divvied this up into uh, three big chunks. Trouble's despair, trouble's purpose, and then trouble conquered. So let's look first of all at trouble's despair. Verse 8. Let's look at what they were experiencing. He calls it an, an affliction. Maybe he's talking about uh, the suffering that he endured in Ephesus, but we don't know exactly the nature of the affliction about which Paul is speaking here or writing. <clears throat> but we know this. He wrote that we were so utterly burdened. It was, it was excessive. It was intense. It was burdensome. The Bible doesn't make light of affliction. The Bible does not make light of suffering or what we will be called to endure. And I think that's important for us to remember too. Have you ever uh, shared your soul with that friend as you were uh, utterly burdened by something and had them just kind of slough it off as not important or you just need to get over it or it's not that bad. Now, Paul here says, no, we were so utterly burdened. The, the affliction was so excessive and he confesses, it's, it was beyond our strength. 
It was more than we, on our own, could handle. It was beyond anything that we, in our own strength, could endure. To the point that we despaired of life itself. We despaired of life itself, verse 8 says. So we think about this burden and we think about this affliction. And, and in Paul's life, we don't know exactly what it was that he was uh, talking about at that time. But I'm sure in the last couple of years, you have experienced some of this yourself. Uh, and it could be any number of things, any number of burdens or trials that, uh, that brought you to the brink of despair. You felt so utterly burdened. You knew it was excessive. You knew it was beyond your ability to cope. You knew it was beyond your strength to endure. He says, we despaired, Paul wrote, we despaired of life itself. We didn't know what the point was anymore. We don't know what the point of, of living was. We, we weren't, maybe Paul's writing here that he wasn't sure whether or not they were going to survive the burden, whatever they were going through. I think of many people that have suffered many things, and obviously it's not appropriate to list those things here, but I think that we, uh, we can understand the pain here. We, we can read these words and we can understand the pain about which Paul is speaking to one degree or another. Let's talk secondly about trouble's purpose. Because as believers, we understand that affliction and trouble and burden, these are not just things that happen for no reason. God has a purpose in these things. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to start reading this passage at verse 3, because verse 4 makes very clear that the trouble equips us, that God uses trouble, trials, afflictions, burdens to equip us. He says that God is the... Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions. So we see also that God is a God who provides comfort. So, so that when Paul says here that uh, we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength in verse 8, it's fine that we're burdened beyond our strength because we're not ever burdened beyond God's strength. So verse 4 points out it's God who comforts us. He comforts us in all that in all our affliction, in all our affliction, so that see this is the purpose. This is the this is the reason. This is again the grace of God that through his revelation in Scripture shows us that there is a purpose for these things. So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. God allows us to go through these things. God allows us to go through difficult times so that as his comfort intercedes and sees us through, then we are equipped and prepared and taught how to help others go through times like the ones we just endured. And, and frequently in counseling over the last couple of decades, I've had the opportunity to, to encourage people with this verse and with this truth that, that God is allowing them to go through something, and frequently it's horrific things. God is allowing them to endure these things. First of all, he hasn't let them left them alone. He will go with them through it. God comforts, and he's the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. He is able to comfort us and to see us through whatever it is that we're enduring. But that he sees us through for a reason. So frequently what I'll tell people is, okay, as you endure this, Know that God's going to see you through. Run to, run to him. And we'll talk more about these things in a second. But also, after we're through it, look for ways in which we can use that experience and the comfort of God and the, the uh, proof of his faithfulness to minister to others. Help others have the hope knowing that God can see them through as well. We understand that as God is the uh, Father of mercies and God of all comfort, He comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will then be equipped to offer counsel and encourage people to trust God and to run to God and let them know that God can see them through their afflictions and troubles and burdens too. 
That's the first thing. Trouble's purpose. It equips us. Secondly, trouble's purpose drives us to God. Look at verse 9. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. You see, he says we had despaired of life itself in verse 8. And he said, indeed, we had we'd felt that we had received the sentence of death. We had no idea how we were going to live through these things. But that was, right, again, purpose clause, that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God. You see, part of why God allows us to go through incredibly difficult things that we could never get through on our own is to teach us to stop relying on ourselves. We can't do everything. We are not omnipotent. We are not uh, self-sufficient. We need God. So Paul here is writing and he says he did this. He allowed us to go through this to teach us not to rely on ourselves, but on him. It's an amazing truth. It's, it's a comforting truth. May we be people that, that rely upon God, not on just the things that we can't handle, but in everything. Because honestly, we can't handle anything on our own. We can't even desire to do good on our own. And the end of verse 9 there is fascinating too. So it taught us to rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Now, in verse 8, he says that they, they despaired of life itself. In verse 9, he says that we felt that we had received the sentence of death. And that drives to God, drives them to God, who raises the dead. So even in death, Paul is saying, big deal, they're going to kill me? God raises the dead. God is able to even bring me back to life if he desires, if they should kill me. I'm not going to rely on myself. I'm going to rely upon God. And God is able to accomplish all his holy will. And he'll do whatever it is that he wants with my life and even through my death and resurrection, should he desire. It's, it's an amazing thing. So God does this for our good. But he also does this for his own glory. Because, again, going back to verse 4, he equips us to help others. And as we help others, even in that, it's not about us. It's about pointing others to the God who is able. And even in this, in verses 8 and 9, we see that as, as God was using these troubles to teach them to rely upon him, not self, that's for his glory. So that God is glorified in being enough. God is glorified in being able. God is glorified in showing that he is the sovereign God, as we talked about yesterday. He is the sovereign God who is able to and who will absolutely accomplish his holy will. All of that goes to the glory of God. So in our despair, in our trouble, in our affliction, God is able. He walks with us through it. He meets those needs for us, and then he uses it for a purpose of glorifying himself and helping others. So we see that trouble is conquered, that we go from trouble again to triumph. So verse 10, it says, he delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. So we see that, we, that, that the trouble, that the affliction is conquered by God. That God delivered them in the past. He's delivering them now and he's trusting. And on him we've set our hope that he will deliver us again. And they're trusting that God's going to deliver them in the future. <clears throat> past, present, and future. God is a God who saves and delivers in the midst of hardships. And then we have, in verse 11, we see the importance of prayer. You must also help us, how? By prayer. So that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So you must help us. We, we help carry each other's burdens. We help... Uh, comfort each other by praying for each other because in that we're casting it all upon God and crying out to God that we need help and we're we're admitting our insufficiency and confessing God's sufficiency you must help us by prayer for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many see God uses prayer 
God accomplishes his will. He's called his people to pray, and he uses the prayers of his people to accomplish his will, glorify himself, and help us. And there's many different uh, ways in which that happens scripturally. I remember we did the study on a Wednesday night years ago. It was the book put out by Don Carson called Praying with Paul. Great book. If you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read it. Where he goes through biblical prayers and analyzes what we're called to pray for and about and how God uses those things. God uses prayer. We need to partner through prayer for each other. That's why last week when we talked about the pastor search stuff and the transition of the church, it was a crucial, crucial that we call the congregation to prayer for those things. Prayer allows many to rejoice, many to participate in one man's triumph. And as we finished last year the study of uh, Acts, remember when we were going through the Bible study on Acts, we see Acts chapter 12. In Acts chapter 12, uh, Herod had killed James, the brother of God, John, sorry, Herod had killed James, the brother of John. And then he sees that the Jews like that, so he arrests Peter. And then he was going to have Peter in prison for a little while and then uh, bring him out to the people. Now it says in Acts 12, verse 5, So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him, earnest prayer for him, was made to God by the church. And then it says when Herod was about to bring him out, that very night Peter was sleeping. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers as he's about to be probably brought out to be executed by Herod. And God sends an angel of the Lord who wakes him up, says, get up. Uh, Peter stands up, the chains fall off his hands. The angel says, put your clothes on and follow me. Uh, and he does that and he sneaks out past all the guards and then it says in verse 11, when Peter came to himself, he said, now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me. So Peter wakes up like fully and he's free. And then verse 12 says, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And then he knocks on the door and the servant uh, girl, Rhoda, goes to the door and answers it. And she's so excited. She she runs back and says, hey, it's Peter. And they say, hey, did you let him in? And she goes, oh, let me go let me go let him in. All right, so here's the point. We remember this story. We remember this account. But it's bookended in Scripture with the mention of prayer. Verse 5 says the church of God was praying for him. And then we have the miracle. And then uh, Peter goes and he joins them. And what are they doing? They're praying. We should likewise be a praying people. We, we should pray for all of, the, all of the things about which we need to pray. Uh, we should be praying for uh, persecuted believers. We should be praying for the comfort of those who we know are struggling and going through difficult times and enduring afflictions, such as the ones we're reading about here that Paul and his companions endured. God uses prayer. And as we pray for each other, I believe it's one of the ways in which God uh, draws our hearts and minds together in unity. Uh, let's look at Romans chapter 12, and we will uh, conclude here this evening. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, and then we're going to skip down to verse 12. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, as believers, as the church, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. So we're united as the body of Christ. Skip down to verse 12. <clears throat> well, verse 9. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Here it is. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. So again, I, I wanted to go to this verse in Romans 12 because we see the unity of the body of Christ that we're 
even though we're different and we're individuals and we have different giftednesses and different things to which we're called within the within the body, some things are true for all of us. We should be loving each other. We should hate what's evil. We should hold fast to what's good. We should rejoice in hope, persevere in tribulation, or be patient, it says, in tribulation, and be constant in prayer for each other, for the glory of God, that we will... Uh, we will be seen through difficult times by God, that God will see us through difficult times for his glory. And we look forward to the day when we're rejoicing that all this uh, pandemic stuff is behind us and, and we are continuing to move forward, as we are even now in the midst of the pandemic, uh, but that we're continuing to move forward for the glory of God, united as a local assembly, uh, patiently enduring in affliction, being strengthened by God for his glory, being equipped by God, and being fervent in praying for each other. Let's be that kind of people in that kind of church. Father, we are thankful uh, for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, our Savior. We're thankful that we know that one day creation will be redeemed. We're thankful for salvation and the gospel and Christ's work on our behalf. Father, we're thankful for the belief uh, that you've given us and the salvation that you've given us. We pray, Lord, that you would make us a praying people, that you give us a desire and an affection, a love of prayer that we would constantly be praying for, uh, not just ourselves and our needs, but for the needs of those around us, and especially those within uh, the church, within the local assembly, missionaries far and wide, and brothers and sisters that we haven't met yet who are being persecuted and are being called to endure for the faith. Father, we're thankful that we know you're with us. We're thankful that we know that there's a purpose for the things you allow us to go through. May we be equipped to offer comfort to those who uh, will desperately need uh, the comfort that can only come from you. I pray that we'd be faithful with as many days as you give us. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.